All right, welcome back everyone. Today we are focused on veterans health care, which is a great marriage between our two focus areas from this month and next month. This month we're focused on health care and particularly developing a national health care uh, strategy, which is proving to be extremely fruitful and categorically different than what we've seen from either of the national parties. Uh, and so I'm quite excited about it. When that can help vets, I'm even more excited. Uh, our, our veterans health program actually is quite, quite good in many areas, but what a lot of people don't realize is that it's actually uh, different per location. And so some people have a really great experience and some people have not so good of an experience. And what we really need to do is make sure that those positive experiences are being shared across the system so that we're helping all of our vets. Next month, uh, like I said, we're gonna be segueing uh, into military and I, I've been kicking around the idea of writing more of a national service strategy of which course military fits into that piece but you know there's there's a lot to be said for promoting patriotism and promoting an understanding of how we can support our country at the individual community state and national level uh, but if you have no opportunity to be part of that system to understand how it works to understand how you can serve, it, it, it's hard to understand when we have problems how to fix them. And so we think it would be really beneficial if we recognized and, and created the opportunities for individuals of all ages and all backgrounds and all skill sets to be better part of service. So we'll be talking a little bit about that over the next month, but I think my dad just came on, so we're gonna go ahead and add him. And here he comes. All right. Hello. It appears. What can I tell you? <laughs> Welcome to live, right? There's, there's always yeah. some sort of issue. Well, I've already given a little bit of an intro, Dad, but I'll, I'll bring you a little bit up to speed because today we're talking about veterans health. And as I was right. saying before you came online, it's a really nice marriage between our focus this month on healthcare and our focus next month on the military. And what I was wanting to share with you and with everyone else is what we're finding as we develop this national health care uh, strategy. And I'm really excited about it because what, we're, what we've been able to put together is far more substantive than what we've actually seen from either party. And more to the point, I know why neither of the recommendations from the Democrats or the Republicans are sustainable. Basically, across both categories, they are sticking with a sickness model. You go to the doctor when you have an illness, you see your provider, we reimburse them. When we change our mission goal to health, <laughs> to staying healthy, we actually approach the entire problem differently. There's a lot of discussion about the possibility of actually paying when you're healthy instead of when you're sick. So there's a motivation on, on providers and systems to actually focus on that, on that support space. There's also uh, very clear data that if all we do is expand current systems, we're going to spend a lot of money. We're not going to increase quality. We're not going to improve efficiency. And eventually the, the, the um, system will actually be unsustainable. So from the Democrat perspective, the Medicare for all concept is really an expansion of an, of an existing, old, very old, I mean, from the 60s delivery model uh, that's going to cost a lot of money to implement and, and will predictably create an untenable situation given how many people are coming into the system. Alternatively, the, the Republicans are recommending a, a competition space much more in the private sector the additional problem this brings, on top of the one I just mentioned, is that you have for-profit businesses that are coordinating and facilitating uh, pharmaceuticals and healthcare when we talk about illness care or disease care. And what that means is that the focus is on maximizing profit versus maximizing health. So that is the reason you have to have government involved. This is the reason that we have to rethink the entire system. And as it pertains to our vets, 
it is to me an absolute requirement that we support, honor, and take care of our vets in the unique ways that they need it beyond uh, that which they experience here in our own soil, but to include what I now call life, limb, and mind that they sacrifice by defending our country. So that brings with it some unique challenges. So just wanted to preface with some of that and, and share with you that we've got some really neat things coming tomorrow. Um, so, so definitely check back and, and be ready to download the strategy because it's, um, it's exciting stuff. I know. I, I, I don't know why I get excited about strategies, but <laughs> I get excited when I find something new and tangible, realistic, implementable, translatable, uh, executable. Uh, that's, that's good news. Yeah. Um, I'll just take a couple of the points, but my main point would be, and part of the biggest problem that's, I think, in delivering healthcare, whichever means we try to decide to do it, um, is the delivery to the lowest person on how to execute against that. Because we're talking about a culture change yes. across the board. 100%. That, and that delivery is very difficult because people are programmed from an early age on how to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And even, even from a veteran's health perspective, okay, even when you're in the military and after you've gotten out of the military, is the only time, like you stated, is that the only time we went and sought out healthcare was when we were already ill rather than when we weren't. However, the military does have programs where they do a lot of, you know, investing in trying to have a healthy lifestyle. Is it as easy and is it maintained? Probably not unless you're located on a submarine at the bottom of the ocean somewhere because you're pretty isolated and you're going to eat whatever they're going to give you. And if it's healthy food across the board, that's what you're going to end up doing. If you're out on a, uh, an army base somewhere and you live off base and, you know, the McDonald's is across the street, you're going to run over there and go get it on the way to work, whatever you're going to do. So we're, and that brings a point of, where I was also looking is the fact is that, you know, our country is, is based on competition between whichever unit you want to talk about. And then in this case, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, you know, the doctors, the, you know, the, the hospitals and that kind of stuff. It's, a, it's going to be a huge thing to tackle and deliver. Um, and you're going to have to have a lot of buy-in from a lot of senators and Congress people to really want to. I, I I'm that. not going to agree on that point. I, okay. my, one of my requirements to myself was that all strategies I come up with require no input from Congress. Okay. Well, we already have plenty of money in the executive branch. We already have plenty of programs available. We already have allocations in excess of what we need. There is no need to spend more money and there is no need to ask for more involvement from Congress. Okay. This exists. Well, it's just not being efficiently executed in a holistic fashion. It's not quite. Well, and I think that goes, yeah. And I think that goes across the board of what you're trying yes. to deliver on your entire message is yes. basically, you know, and anybody that was in business and wanted to reshape anything as I did on a very small scale, but that was the first thing I ever did if I ever went in some place was to reshape things. Because usually it was pretty inefficient the way it was running, and so you needed to optimize whatever right. resources. And and always show the customer you weren't going to spend any more money. Yeah. It was their money you were spending, yeah. I mean, in, in, in essence. So I always had to redesign something and say, all right, we're not going to do it the old way. First off, you probably weren't very happy. Secondly, let's get it you know, rolling and quickly, and so blah, 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 we go through that. But yeah, you're right. And and the thing is, the most difficult sell is to make sure that everybody understands um, how, it, how it actually creates an environment of a much better living environment when they do it with a little bit more commitment to, to the health side. And I think your idea of paying them to be healthy almost makes more sense than paying them after they're sick. I mean... Uh, Wow, hadn't thought of it in that way, but wasn't my geez. idea. But there's a fair amount of uh, data on this, 
and but that's why I got excited because by really doing some investigative work, you can find some not just you know people having opinions, but people who have really done their homework uh, and worked with the systems and found where the errors are and where the benefits are. That have asked different mm -hmm. questions, that have tested these things out. Everything I'm proposing is absolutely doable. It's doable with the money we have. It's doable within the programs we already have executing. And that, that's huge because you're right, Dad. When you, when you want to make an enormous change and evolution, you have to be very careful that you're not reinventing the wheel, but that you are actually right. simply better coordinating the efforts. And so that's really, really one of the parameters and requirements that I've held myself to. Um, because I don't think you can, I think one of the things we hear all the time, and it totally undermines the political system writ large, people make promises they can't keep. So if you're relying yeah. on Congress, there is no possibility, no possibility that you can guarantee an outcome, period. That is, doesn't matter who you are, you cannot promise that. So... Um, what I want to make sure was that anything we said, we could promise and, and absolutely agree to deliver. So I'm excited to say that. Now, I'm going to push back on another point. Said the military is not necessarily focused on, on health. And I would challenge this. Now, I do think there may be a difference in timing. In other words, when you served, it may be very different than the way it is now. But the way it it's is... It's very possible. Yeah. Probably 99% possible. Yeah, I mean, I come out of personnel and readiness from the Pentagon. Our focus is on ensuring that every, every individual, which is essentially a human asset, is constantly at readiness. And if you need to be at readiness, that means you need a family unit that's working. You need a finance, financial situation that is healthy. It means that you need a body that is ready to deploy. It means that you need the information you need to be successful in theater, keep yourself alive, keep your, your teammates alive, uh, your units alive, and to maintain the technology or infrastructure that you're commanding. So we are absolutely focused on ensuring that you are a healthy unit, a healthy asset. And health is not just defined by whether or not you, you have a cold. It is defined by you as an entire human and the systems that are around you are all working to make you operate at your very best. So I, I really think, now that doesn't mean we have it all nailed, but I absolutely do think the structure in military is focused on ensuring that because these are the assets we're deploying. Right. So just as you want, okay. uh, yeah, just as you want to, you, you want your, your airplane to be <laughs> ready, so too do you want your humans. Sure. Yeah, and so right. I think that concept is very translatable to our country if we talk about national readiness. But well, we weren't ready in Vietnam. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of a lot of bad things. Anyhow, we won't go there, but we weren't ready, okay? That just wasn't, wasn't happening. It was more about, let's see how many bodies can we throw at them, you know, up against the wall and hope everything works. Well, yeah, that, I don't want that, to... No, but that, I mean, that was a strategy. Well, I don't know if it was a strategy, a tactic that was common was the more people you have, the longer it takes for someone to plow through you. It's not right. efficient. Um, and actually, it's a great metaphor for why it is you don't want to just throw more money at healthcare. Right. Because you're, you're essentially using the same concept, right? You just expand and have as much money in place as possible so that you can buy yourself out of problems. No. Think more strategically. How do you set up a system that works? Well, I don't, I mean, we're, we're talking big, large scope, and we'll I'll still focus back on healthcare. but the fact is, throughout our entire history in our country, just throwing money at something has never cured it. It never nope. has, never will. It's, 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 the only thing that it does is it says, I did the best I could, so it's up to you to hopefully manage whatever resources I give you to do it at at best and and you know that's why we're so splintered in in different areas and why different areas aren't functioning at a high level anywhere so um well, going I back to part of it is we'll go that, back that to the we we hire people who don't have the skill set of problem solving we hire people whose skill set is fundraising sure. so then we shouldn't really right. be surprised that their answer to solving a problem involves fundraising it it 
it, right. it kind of <laughs> kind of segues. Okay, go ahead, keep going. <laughs> so, going back, I, I just want to go back then, kind of do a full circle back to VA health and everything yeah. like we started out. In fact, is I think um, you did some interesting figures the other day. You were talking about I think it was ten thousand per patient. You know, civilian six thousand for VA patient. Um, I don't know if that. Um, I think that translates into a little bit different way of doing things than they do in civilian. You know, it's it's not in a a for profit environment, so it's it's kind of going in in a different direction that way. And that certainly doesn't mean that we have to sit down and and to me um, take the for-profit motive out of healthcare, um, but I think it needs to be understood that the goal is the health and not so much the profit. And I know that discussion is just that horse is that poor How horse is dying. I mean, you know, that, How would you tell somebody? I know be a that's for-profit good. business. But know. by the way, curb your profits. How, how do you? Do I that? know you can't. And, and you can't. Do you that. don't. And no. and and it's it's and really it's hard. And so in the I, pharmaceutical space. Unfortunately, it really is. I mean, I just, I can take my glasses off and I can see now. I just ah! wanted to let you know. Um, so I'll do that. Just, I haven't just seen for the, the glasses, I, I don't know, in 20 years. <laughs> Probably 50. No, there was the so time anyhow. you lost them in the ocean. I remember that. Oh, yes. Well, that was an event we won't discuss. Okay, that was a little historical in nature. But, um, I, think we, I think we have a uh, picture of that somewhere. <laughs> oh, please. Oh, please. Uh <laughs> the uh, the uh, and it goes back to to like with my cataracts or anything else like that. You know, we've we've found more efficient ways to do it, obviously, and take care of everything. We're not sitting there. I always said it was. Uh, I went in. I was a little afraid that you know some guy with an exacto knife was just going to try to fix my eyeball. You know, and that was a little scary. Yeah, that's not the way. That's not the way it works. So, but uh, the. Um, and I'm trying to figure out, I'm trying to remember where I was going with that whole thing. But, but, um, I think the V, you know, it's, it's the VA is operating quite well in certain places and then not quite as efficient in others. Um, being as large as it is, I can understand that because every time, uh, it all depends on the folks, you know, and where they are and what they're what their expertise is and how they're doing it so and i hate to hate to blame the secretary of or the you know the veterans administration chief because wrapping his arms around that whole thing has got to be incredibly difficult at some points in times i think they've made great strides in the last few years because of the uh, amount of attention that's placed on it and it and rightfully so because i think it was floundering at a certain point I don't know how many people on the call here today, which I want to thank everyone that gets on the call. It's really so. Um, but in the you know in the past, it, it's been uh, little. The VA received a lot of criticism. I think some of the programs they had, if they were even implemented so much in the you know in the civilian space. It would be better. They're trying to implement them. They're doing a little bit, but they all have a different idea. So it's it's not coordinated. It's not it's not anything where it's singular in nature. Um, I get notices almost every day about some incredible, you know, happening in the VA, which I think that's where uh, you know media um, has really played off significantly in helping us uh, get some place. Uh, Gary is very involved out in California and San Diego area with the folks out there with uh, VA, you know, vet, uh, my vet health. Um, he's very, he's been very, um, how should I say, uh, involved in it, but he also is educated in it and, and really made an effort to, to get the folks out there, the people that he knows in his groups and everything like that to continue to really promote uh, my uh, vet health. And so, uh, which is a great program. I, I don't know how much you know about it, but it's really, I mean, you can do anything. I mean, you can make your appointments, you can read your history, you can download everything that's ever happened to you in, in the VA and what's going on. And, and that's extremely useful 
if you you know if you're curious about it and and you need and we got to develop that curiosity my my struggle comes again with with all the programs again is going down to the lowest level how do we get it there how do we get the enthusiasm built to participate how do we get them to understand that this is for their own you know uh, well-being and and not just a program for for you know a certain amount of elites and that um, you know so how do you propose to get that going what's what's the initiative that would really get that off the ground you have to start with education okay it, it literally is on uh so i've broken down the strategy to three main points Pre- prevent connect deliver and in prevention the very first thing listed is education you have to bring these concepts straight into early childhood care i mean this has to be day one everybody in the country has to start thinking differently. Um, and so that's the first piece is people have to build it into their expectation for their lives. The second thing that we have to do is really create a, a culture shift. Uh, I ordered a burrito the other day. Burrito, mm, should be about this big. This burrito was about this high. It would have fed eight people. And I looked at the woman and I said, really? Really? She goes, yeah, you can do it. I said, you won't even notice that I ate anything when I finished this. Um, we have to change the way that we look at food and the way we look at what we, what we take into our body and exercise and everything. So again, there's an element of education, but then the next layer is actually changing national habits, not just individual habits. It has to be easier. When I get that burrito, it needs to be the right size to begin with so that I'm not staring at an enormous plate of food that quite frankly, all of us pick at, right? We sit, we eat, we talk, we keep eating, we keep eating, we keep eating. Not because we're still hungry, but because it's literally just there. So, talk to Mary about that. Uh, Ask Mary about me and French fries. Uh, well, we all do it. Every single one of us does it, right? And, and I say all the time, I am strong enough to not purchase it. I am not strong enough to not eat it if it's in front of me. So if you give right. me a bag of Oreos, I'm probably gonna eat the whole bag. Well, people are not like this in other countries. They're not, they're just simply not. And part of it is literally access. Um, I was in uh, Norway and I just had a really long, hard week. I was exhausted. Um, I want, I'd had so much um, seafood and, and wild game. And I just wanted, I just needed some carbs. I needed some pasta, something basic. And so I remember because I, I, I purchased what was a $23 pasta bowl. And in my head, I was going to get pasta. What was delivered was pasta. <laughs> I looked at the woman. I said, I'm going to need four of these to even like sort of have a meal. And it struck me, you know, that I have an American mentality and, and it's feeding into everything. Um, because then it gets into, uh, you know, more diabetes, more sickness, more cancer, more everything. Third layer, we have to change the way that we approach work. Stress kills, bottom line. So this work-life balance concept, it's not happening. We're not balanced. And we're, we're not approaching work that way. Now that we're connected by our phones, we're 24-7 accessible, which means work is connected to us all the time. And if you like your work, you're definitely engaging all the time. So we need to create a work-life integration. The point is there are layers of changes that have to occur. It sounds like a lot of work, and it would be a lot of work, but it's not an impossible thing to achieve because each one of these layers is already in some way working on this pos- this concept, but they're not coordinated. So the only thing you actually have to add is a coordinating unit. So you mentioned the app. My vet uh, health. What does that do? It does what you just described. It coordinates, right? It makes everything be in one place, which makes it easier for you to access, execute. And when you want to do something, you go there because it makes your life easier, not because you keep reminding yourself you need to do something different. We need to make everything across the board easier. So when you come into school, you know how about your body, you know about nutrition, you know about exercise, you know about what to expect in life and how to balance your stress. When you go into a, a place to eat, the food options are appropriate, and what you order is appropriate. When you go into work, 
you have an expectation, both the employer and the employee, that you will have an interaction and a, and a space that is health promoting for life. When you do all of that, then you start to see a change. People are ready because people are stressed, people are pained, and we're spending a lot of money fixing things. So this is doable. And I, and I really, I do think it's the vet model. I think it is the vet model of, or I should say the military model, whole person. You don't just look at illness. You look at how do you sure. think? How do you think you're going to get um, entrepreneurs, uh, business owners, um, even large? I think larger corporations are much easier to handle than than the small business owner, and for simply because they're basically running on empty most of the time. I mean, they're if you talk about a family running on check to check. Small business guys are doing the same thing. Right. And to convince them how to, you know, do this, I don't know that you can do it at the at their level. It, you have to do it through what you described as maybe on the government side, simply because you have to create a, 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 an even playing field. So if you don't create that even playing field across the board, then each one is going to try to do something different to make it, you know, make make their headway and 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 grow their business in a certain fashion even if it's already grown it's difficult so talk to me about what you mean by small business because what i described is education which has nothing to do with small businesses right so that 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 is outside of that space i'm talking about the you know the little restaurant on the corner i'm talking about the guy that has so why, you know, what, say so, 25 employees. Wait, wait, take that example. Um, You've got a restaurant. What is it sure. the restaurant is having to do differently? Sell less food? Sell smaller um, portions? No, caring about the employee and watching on what they do and how to execute against it. And, and pay, you know, if it's a, but they if we're not be, paying anymore, you, they, it's an education. It's a culture shift. I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, so. it doesn't cost the small business anymore. However, I will say that that the work-life integration concept, that does affect small businesses. But I would actually argue it's incredibly beneficial to small businesses. The point at which a small business does not have to pay for healthcare and worry about that, they have the opportunity to hire people in what's happening going forward, which is what's called a gig economy. A gig economy is um, what young people are starting to use, where you have a particular skill set. And a, a company, a business, large or small, hires you for your skill set project based. So now I don't have to take on all, you're basically a 1099 for me and I only purchase you for when I need you, but your additional growth, education, experience, healthcare, uh, time off, all of that is covered outside of the business. So I'm only purchasing what I need instead of having to take you on as a full cost employee. So I actually think this would be better for small businesses and I think it would enable them to have different cost modeling that would be far more efficient and far more um, uh, added value because it's a lot less risk. Okay. Yeah. And the health care would be covered through the individual? Right, because once you once you get to a universal health care space, now everybody right. um, can choose their jobs based on their capabilities instead of the requirement to pay for um, the, those extra benefits. So small businesses would not have to pay for benefits anymore. Okay. So it'd be actually less expensive. <laughs> so it's a little bit more, um, yeah, to the business. Yeah. Well, they'll pay for it somewhere. I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to. Well, but it yeah, won't be as direct. It won't be a direct cost. It'll be it a, wouldn't be a direct know, a cost, and it actually would, I believe it would be less. Okay. But the biggest okay. thing is that there would also be indirect benefits, right? By being able to have employees, uh, you know, if you only need somebody for 20 hours or you only need them for six months, you don't have to take them on as a full-time position and essentially care for every piece of them, which would be a huge it, benefit. It, it's, um, there's a large part of the, the population, though, that kind of likes the, you know, being taken care of. Uh, lifestyle, meaning, um, how should I put it, with with you know reasonable <laughs> uh, terms, um, meaning it it's easier on their life to know that they have a place to go. It's taken care of. This is I come home, I go in, 
I do my job, I come home, and the rest of my time is spent either taking care, you know, taking care of my family, my home, all the things that go along with that. Um, and I think that's when we had the cradle to grave job, you know, type environment. There was a lot of growth uh, financially in, in our country when that was going on too, because the job was was an, a means to an end. It wasn't it wasn't their uh, center of focus. And there's still a large part of the population that really sees life like that. They don't want to be challenged every day to, you know. Uh, I'm only going to get 25 hours this week because I haven't gone out and sold myself to 30 different businesses. That's a tough life. That's okay. a tough life. It's not as easy as, as it sounds. That sounds really great in one part, but it's not as easy on the other. Uh, like, you know, so. Unfortunately, I, I can't stop that train. That train, okay. that train is going because there, there, are, there are two major reasons. The first is global. Hands down, right. everybody under 40 is going to compete globally. Whether they want to or not, the, most jobs are, are able to be performed anywhere in the world. And so you, you have new competition that you hadn't prepared for. The second reason is um, uh, that the, due to us going into this digital age, jobs will be changing, careers will be changing, meaning those that don't exist today will exist tomorrow, but they will also go away in your lifetime and new ones will pop up. So your ability to have a steady state is extremely low in likelihood going forward. We expect people to have three to six careers, which means everyone will have to be a lifelong learner. They will have to live in a level of chaos that is not conducive to the human body. And they will have to do just as you said, dad, be constantly looking for the next job. These are not entirely positive realities. This is the reason that healthcare must also include an element of mental health care. And we cannot fail to recognize that the human body is not entirely wired for it. Chaos yeah, is stressful. Um, and I'll take it. Um, it is. Um, I'll take it from the standpoint of um, managing a business and also trying to, you know, sell your business at the same time and yeah. how much stress that creates yep. in your life. And we're always, you're always yep. talking about reducing stress. It's actually going to increase stress yep. because, you know, any time that you have to go out and I'll just say it, it's sort of the same thing as fundraising. I mean, it doesn't matter if, if you become fundraisers, how good are you going to be at your job? So right. it's another, it's another one of those, yep. you know, it conundrums that are, are going to be difficult to, to execute against and uh, you know and we're getting deeper into a lot of things that probably we didn't think we were going to get into but my question so I, I think you know you're seeing it in how uh, the big cities are having to deal with with the homeless situation yeah. with this there's a, just a lot of people that can't do that they just and we got to figure out how we're going to find a home for those folks because yeah. What are we going to do? I mean, there okay. is going to be this is going to get be a, lot a large worse. number. It yes. is, and so that's why Veterans Health, in my mind, is actually really beneficial to this point because what we look at when we when we help our military personnel be at readiness to go into theater is that we are not just looking at them to be physically agile. We're also looking for them to be cognitively agile. In other words, we need to protect mm -hmm. the mind. I just finished a paper. Um, uh, on cognitive weaponry and part of that paper is about something I call mind armor which really is helping the brain be insulated from the stress of being in theater of being in combat the exact same concept translates to dealing with stress that is going to come at us from every direction in the future chaos of this country so when we talk about national readiness this is at the core of this point the world is going to become more chaotic more overwhelming and what we know is that that affects the body and the mind substantially we need a leader who understands how to approach that in a way that has our people ready to handle it because our nation as a whole will suffer without it and so that's to me wrapping a, a bow around our discussion today veterans health needs to first and foremost be something that we not only protect, but that we constantly evolve to 
um, bring to our vets the honor and the respect of the unique issues that they have. Secondarily, we need to look at our VHA system to inform a civilian system complement that supports whole person health. That's when we have a win. I will do one last plug, Dad, um, because our healthcare strategy will be coming out tomorrow. We have officially made a transition in the campaign. We are moving forward with uh, aggressive fundraising and uh, sharing information with press because I am now I am now convinced that we have something very tangible, real, and useful for not just politics, but for our country. So I hope people will look up our national environmental strategy. Our website is, is tight now. It is ready to be reviewed. Um, and tomorrow, look for our national healthcare strategy. And stay tuned as we move right into military. Um, we're lining up speakers for, for next month. Um, but now's the time to start thinking about donated. Now is the time, what I call, be an investor. This isn't about giving a dollar or giving $3 anymore. This is about recognizing that if we are going to prepare this country for the future, we need everybody who understands what's coming next to help invest. Give us your time. Give us your brilliance. Give us um, your connections. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Um, but also make a donation. I hate to go for money, but the reality is in order to share a message, we have to get marketing people involved because I'm no fundraiser. <laughs> I do the work. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be the organizer. Um, I yeah, think yeah. I, I'll be really honest in, in um, the, your core supporters, which with me and, you know, all our core supporters, uh, probably a hundred core supporters that you've had. I think we've all been waiting for that to happen with you. So yeah. I'm glad we're moving in that direction because the constant question to, to me from, the folks that you've already met and, and want to join in are, when are we going to get more national and where is this going to go and how fast? And so I'm glad we're moving in that direction. I applaud everybody that's on the call today. I love the support. Um, well, I'm going to give and, you this uh, metaphor, Dad. Oh. This is what you tell people. To date, we have watched people run a foot race. I am building a flying machine. <laughs> okay. So simply because I heard that one the other day. Yeah. So simply because somebody is standing at mile six and you're saying, I don't see you running, where are you? You don't have to worry because what I'm doing is checking every gauge. I'm checking every piece because I'm not getting in that flying machine until I'm certain it is going to take off and keep flying. So I need to Sounds like you just started it. I just turned it on. Yeah, well, I've been checking all the gauges. I've been making sure everything's going to work. But this is the right way to do it. It's just that no one has ever seen a flying machine in this metaphor. Right. So they're constantly looking for a person who's got the best tennis shoes, who runs their legs the fastest. And I'm looking at them going, it doesn't matter if I'm wearing tennis shoes, it doesn't matter if I could run because I can fly. And there we stand. Right. That, that's the perfect ending. <laughs> hey, All it right, is Dad. the perfect ending. <laughs> Love you, girl. You'll be safe. You too. And keep, I'm glad keep you're that that engine in that, keep, keep that engine in that truck running. <laughs> Oh, man. I know. I know. I know. It's super fun. We knew it would happen at some point. All right. We'll talk to you later, Dad. Thanks. See you. All bye -bye. right. Take care. Bye-bye.